Welcome back to The Nero Show. It is episode unlucky 13. Guys, in today's episode, we're going to talk a little bit about the festive 500. Unsanctioned racing. Were we wrong about Trek? What trends are we actually going to dip our toe in in 2023? And yes, it's back. Chris's Creator's Corner. All right, let's get into it. I'm a bit worried about today's episode because I have a feeling we might be uh, disagreeing on a few things. Do you want to start us off, Jesse, because a little uh, event caught your eye during the week? Could we call it an event? So it's Hmm. uh, a massive bunch ride that I had heard a bit about but never seen in Perth in Western Australia. And the photos from this, it was insane. So um, one of the reasons why it's such a big uh, thing, it's, it's run on Boxing Day. It's totally unsanctioned, on just unstructured bunch ride. But because um, a lot of the pros are back in town, it had some big names. So Jai Hindley, Ben O'Connor, uh, Harry Sweeney, Luke Durbridge, Sam Wilson, blah, 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 splitting up along some sections. It's a couple of little short uh, KOMs and then a, a, a bunch sprint, which is yeah big bragging rights if you win. Um, no surprise, Sam Wells had won. But just even like that stretch of road, there's a photo on the stretch of road where they're finishing and there's like a line of people either side of the road. Yeah. And it's just a random road <laughs> at a random morning. It's not closed and it's 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 crazy. Do you, do you like this? Are you, 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 you're on board with it? Like I think it's cool. Yeah. It's, it's, okay, can yeah. I go? All right, go. I love this. Yeah? I love it. I, I want to see more of it. Um, okay, the pro element thing, that's that's kind of nice. Yeah, that's that adds a bit of bit of froth to it at the end of the year. But I would love to see more of this, Jesse. I am at the point with a lot of events and everything and having seen what goes into them and how many events get cancelled and how the challenges are for all these events to go ahead. I would love to see more of this. I'm sorry. Have you seen the video though? I, I, I don't want to go over I'm I, I'm oh, I'm so torn because I'm very much if you're not just do your own thing everyone stay out of each other's way and stop whining about stuff but like I don't mean to be a bit of a Karen but I'm just looking at that and it's like the bunch is splitting up some sections are taking up like two lanes okay they're doing it in the morning it's it's looks freaking it all it takes is one bogan driver that doesn't know what's going on and that is carnage and i just i find it a bit of a shame that like something like that gets so much local buzz and such a good turnout but like an actual race won't really get anywhere well, there's near a reason that turnout. because like a race can't run down the main drag at at that time like it's can't. There's, yeah, there's just true. rational reasons behind that. I totally hear you, mate. I totally hear you. Like 200 people charging down <laughs> the main drag. Like, I, yeah, there's obviously caveats to what I'm saying in terms of that I love this. But like I was just sort of spitballing ideas that like you could you could have a, a call out would go that, you know, you're going to meet at 7 a.m. at, you know, a Sydney centric thing, maybe like Bob and Head or something like that, 7 a.m., Everyone's going to meet up and we're going to chop out to Brooklyn and back, which is kind of like a 40 or 50K undulating road, like road really, um, in the middle of it. Well, not in the middle of the day, but like, you know, on the weekend or something like that. We have that. It's called Westhead Road Race. Yeah. No one goes. We, you can go and do that. So uh, why don't people – do you think it's the fact that Okay, let, Westhead is the prime example because it's very close to what you're saying, similar location, and you might get 15 riders in A grade. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's the fact that it's a race that people don't want to go? Yes. That's, I, I honestly think it's as soon as it's a race and there's prize money, people get nervous and they go, oh, it's a bit too serious and oh, like... It's really, I've got to be really committed to do that. And they just go, oh, I don't want to do that. I mean, yep. I've done that. I yep. barely race for the, I do one Tuesday night at Heffron and that's the only racing I do because I'm sick of the, you get sick of being nervous for things. So I think the, the fact that it's unstructured and it's sort of a race, but it's not a race makes people more likely to want to show up. Yep. hundred um, yeah. percent. Um, and it brings up this whole other thing that. You know, you're then turning, and again, I am someone who's done it this year. I, I have essentially turned a fondo into a race. Yep. Okay? 
I turned barrel into an event that I really wanted to do well at. And, and it, okay, there was elements that were kind of racy in it, but ultimately that was a fondo. And what I thought was interesting is that I would argue that 98% of the people in that event would not even consider pinning a number on in a real race, mm. right? But they would consider that event their race, a race. Mm -hmm. I think, no, I, I mean, I mean, for a lot of people, a, a, a grand fondo, a barrel is a target. And I think the, maybe this is what I said something different to you, but maybe it's a similar thing is that when you rock up to one of those things, you know, you're going to get a fair result for what, for the work you've put That's in. That's what it is. And it's yeah. similar on these yeah. unstructured, these sort of just bunch rides. You rock up, you rip in, you pull hard turns. Someone gives you a pat on the back because you rode well and it's happy days. But when it's a race, it's not like that because you got to suddenly you're then sucking wheels and you're trying to save energy and being coy. And it's it's not fun. Like it's mm. not really that some people enjoy, it, but to the most people, that's not that fun. They just want to rip in and get a fair result. And that's what you get at, at stuff like that. Yeah, it's almost more triathlon-y, like mm -hmm. the, that sort of like attitude to it. That You're going to turn up, you know, bury yourself and yeah, you're going to have a have a go at it. Well, that's how they ran the races. Some of the races when we went to a club race in Amsterdam that we went to when we were in Europe, that's how they run. Uh, a, B, C grade all start together. Everyone goes off. The A graders are just ripping in. It's sort of a race, but they're not really racing. It's just sort of training. Everyone else is just sitting on having a, a good old time. And then 45 minutes in, the C graders sprint and the rest carry on. Hour and 15 minutes in, the, they sprint. And then at the end, it's just the A graders left. They do, you know, another 15, 20 minutes and they have their sprint. So it's a race, but without the pressure. And, you know, a format like that could get a bit of a better turnout where it's less of a you know, less tactical race, I think. I, I don't know. I just, I just saw those pictures of the Perth thing and I kind of flashed back to some of the – there were these kind of – Rafa did these things years ago, right? And they were called like gentlemen's races. And there are unsanctioned events. There were timed unsanctioned events where you were in a team of like three or four. It was essentially like a team time trial over a, over a parkour that might be sort of 160, kind of big day out type stuff, right? And it might be like you had to have a mixed team, like you had to have, you know, one female in your team or one junior in your team or something like that. And it was totally... I'd love someone to raffle to tell, tell me what happened to these because they were totally unsanctioned. They were not allowed to go ahead. <laughs> but, you know, ultimately all they were doing was just like riding around open roads. Like it wasn't like a you, there was nothing to stop them necessarily doing it. But they were filmed and there was a couple in Sydney actually and they just died off. But they were so like so cool, so exciting. Like, all right, let us know down below, guys. Unsanctioned events. I'm sure there are plenty in your area. Let us know. Are you for them? Are you against them? No, no, do whatever you want. Tell us, tell <laughs> us. I was, yeah, all right. I realize I probably outed myself on that. But, okay, while we're talking a little bit about community stuff, I think both of us would probably agree that the Festive 500 is one <laughs> of the best if not the best use of like community, social media, everything sort of coming together to ultimately just get people to ride their bikes. I don't know how I feel about the sort of the flex, the flex festive 500, which is something like the, the 500 Ks in one day, this type of stuff. So what do you think? Is it a soft move or is it a boss move? Well, that's not the Festive 500. There's definitely the Festive 500 wankers. Couple of classes, you've said the one there. It's like, you know what? I'm going to take this amazing community event that everyone participates in and I'm just going to do it all in one day to show I'm better. <laughs> I hate that. I hate it. Or do it all in like two days and then you're two days in and someone's posting on Strava. Oh, completed, right? So... Not a fan. Other one I'm not a fan of. It's like the festive thousand. It's like, <laughs> let's just do double and take everyone who was feeling really good about themselves and riding and just doubling it. And look, if you want to do that because you've got more time to ride, I don't care. I, I just don't like the posting about it because just let it be what it be and stop trying to do the one up. It it, it winds me up. See, I, I'm kind of torn with it because I have no issue with people challenging themselves. Awesome. 
great stuff. You know, the people doing the festive 1000s like probably do ride 500 Ks a week and that's not a big, big deal for them. Go out and ride 1000 Ks, all, all about it. There's the other, the other crowd. There are the guys who are like just fully stretching themselves to make this 500 Ks work. And then they lock, <laughs> lock yeah. on and it's like, oh, that guy did twice as much as me. Like I just feel like it's the wrong time of yeah. year to just flex that at someone. It totally is. So, yeah, I yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like we'll get a bit of pushback on that one. Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, the, the other thing with it is the thing that also why it kind of annoys me is that the whole point of it isn't, okay, it's a festive 500, so it's a distance challenge. But it's not like a physical exertion challenge of fitness. Mm. It's a community event to you know maybe ride with people you don't always ride with, try different routes. It's it's not a competitive. It's a it's a community challenge, not a competitive challenge. It's like don't bring save your competitiveness till January. I don't know. A similar thing with the bloody the wankers that go out on New Year's oh, Day. I was gonna say this, and they and and they they're up at five thirty a.m. Pretty much everyone else is hung over and they're just starting off the year right and they've got to post about it. you just got to be, I feel like of all the times to post, you just got to be cautious if it's Christmas Day or it's New Year's Day not to come off braggy. Maybe in cycling it's not a huge thing. Maybe it's more of like a fitness community thing. Mm. But I've, I, 100, I don't want to like call anyone out, but I have 100% seen like fitness influencers Say like you got to start off the year right. Get out there, get it done. I think that's total. If you want to drink too much on New Year's Eve and ride at five p.m. the next day for half an hour because you feel guilty, go and do it. Just do it. Let yourself do it. Don't feel bad. All right, guys. Let us know down below. Festive five hundred. Did you complete it this year? Is one of your mates done a thousand k's and you just want to punch him in the <laughs> face for doing it? Let us know. So I was out doing my festive five hundred during the week, Jesse Coyle. And uh, I was out doing one of my classic, classic Miller rides out to, out to Brooklyn. And I'm coming back. I'm coming back across the Hawkesbury Bridge and pulled in for a nature break. And goes, going past me are four people with a motorbike in front of them. Nice. Yep. See that very often, if ever, in this part of the world. They're being motor paced. All right. Cool. Anyway, so that... Uh, Continues off into the distance, and um, I, I had a little little squeeze up up Brooklyn, oh, yeah. and kind of got a little bit closer to them towards the top, and I could still see that they were still motor pacing at this point, but then they obviously carried on over the top and continued off into the distance. And Chris, being Chris, uh, when he gets home, he had a little little bit of a look. Sounds like something I'd do, not who, you. <laughs> who'd uh, who'd been doing some uh, some efforts on that day, and I found said four riders. And I also discovered that they'd taken some KOMs and a few QOMs on this particular ride. Now, I deep dived a little bit further and I looked into their titles of their rides and there was no mention of the uh, motor pacing, the vehicle that was being used in the ride. There were a few sort of day for it and morning rides amongst the group. But the QOMs and the KOMs all stood. Hmm. I ask you and I ask the audience, should Chris have flagged these rides? That's, to me, that's a big no-no. You can't do that. If you motor pace a ride, to me, that's, that's private. Strava private. Upload it so you can see it and put that sucker on private. That's hundred percent blatant cheating. So I'm with you. I, I just the, the the full out motor pacing. Now this wasn't like a one out effort. So all the QOMs and KOMs they took were kind of forty minute. I like to call them red path segments. Uh, 40, 50, one hour sort of um, stretches of road because it's one of the, the few stretches of road we have where there's no traffic lights and things like that. So they took all those kind of ones. Now, for me, it's just a pure red flag. I haven't flagged them, but I probably will go back in. But what... I reckon you've got to give a, fire a warning shot, warning shot in the comments. Send them through. Look, um, uh, warning you, I may be flagging this if you don't take this down and then go flag. I think you've got to 
Got a flag. You're riding from Gosford to Sydney <laughs> on the 27th of January. <laughs> consider consider this your so, countdown. But it, it starts the, the question, right? Yeah. Because I still believe that it's not as simple as any assistance is unacceptable. I am a firm believer that lead outs are acceptable in Strava segment challenges. Lead outs that start at the the base of the effort or the beginning of the effort and peel off as it goes along. Is mm-hmm. that fair? Yep. Bunch rides, group rides, all that sort of thing, fine. The only thing I can think of, drafting a bus or a truck, Ooh. I think fine, fair play. Like if you're going along a stretch of road and you know a truck slowly comes by and you want to get in the slipstream, I think thumbs up, go for it. It's not a problem. I would say... So you're allowing the bus? I'm allowing the bus, wow, yes. Wow, totally disagree. Because you can't... If you if the bus came along and you hopped on and you just ripped in and took a segment, a flat one, fair play. Absolutely <laughs> fair play. You shouldn't then have to take yourself off the leaderboard. Um, especially as well because you might get like a segment on a section, but chances are you're not going to get a 20-minute segment behind a bus um, if you did well done. The, the one that comes to mind which is grey area. There was a rumour that on one of the main clubs in Sydney, Bobbin Head East, um, for some of the fast times there, there were staggered riders that were strategically placed along the climb and then someone would come in, they would get let out and as they went up, riders would start like halfway up the climb and do like one or two minute pull and then peel off. So those riders that were assisting hadn't been in front of the rider or from the rider from the bottom. And I think that I'm putting that in bin territory. That's mm. that's flagged, mm. I would say. I'd say you're allowed to sit behind a rider, but they have to come with you from the start of the segment. Yep. Agreed. Yep. No, I agree. That's that I I mean I'm impressed. I mean very by niche. That. <laughs> it's very that is very <laughs> impressive. That you you'd actually get that many friends together to be able to do that. But anyway. Yeah, I'd I'd have to agree with you on that one. Um, The only other one I've heard a little bit of is the e-bike lead out at the bottom, um, which to me is basically motor pacing. So I can't quite see how that fits under the equation. Let us know down below, guys. Strava, what's what's kosher, what's not kosher? Speaking of not kosher, Mm. we were totally wrong last week when we talked about Trek bikes. (laughs) We must be in the world's smallest bubble. I was... It was actually embarrassing because it's like we were so convinced that we like we had it right that Trek bikes are, are, are going downhill. I Turns I, out it's just it's just a Sydney thing. I think I saw about six hundred yeah. treks the next yeah. day. It was like, oh god, everyone's on a trek. I never noticed. No, uh, I stand by the Sydney thing, but then someone said on oh, Canberra they're gone mad. It's the only bike you see. So I think it's literally for whatever reason the bike shops in Sydney aren't selling them because it sounds like especially in the US. And other places in Australia, they're going gangbusters. So uh, I guess we were totally wrong on that. I will say, I will stand by the comment that perception-wise, the premium nature of Trek has diminished. I don't. They're not up there when I'm thinking about high-performance bikes because of the pro peloton side, even though you still see it on the Momo. But it's actually, going into that, there was a few, quite a few comments that that said oh, why does it matter if a pro team rides the bike that doesn't do anything anyway? Just in terms of that, I understand people saying just because a pro team rides a bike doesn't make it a good bike. Totally understand. But in terms of, it's a, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say a pro team riding a bike doesn't make much of a difference in bike sales. Uh, phew, I find that very hard to believe. I mean, the thing we were saying about Trek is specifically because their men's pro team isn't doing that well no okay so this, this could potentially be a very long answer just okay. a warning Go into right? it. so see. not all brands are created equal and not all marketing is created equal so for example like if Devel, if Devel had got a world tour team and a world tour team were not doing that well but they were still at a world tour team it would do wonders for that brand it would have Change for wind space. If wind space is in the world tour next year or 2024, it will do wonders for that brand. And they won't need to win Roubaix on it every year to get the, the froth of that because it's just, it's giving it authenticity of it being at that level. Now, Trek 
has been at that level. Trek, Trek has been aboard some of the most iconic pro-level things we've ever seen, some things that potentially we should never have seen but were still amazing. So for, for a brand like Trek now... They've set that bar so high that to maintain that premium level, their team has to perform well to, to maintain that. So that's sort of the first part of my answer. The, the second is for bike brands going forward, like the, the space that they have to actually do to do their own marketing is becoming smaller and smaller. Like... So by that I mean like, you know, they'll have they'll have the world tour, they'll have that sort of stuff. But but what other what other marketing have they got now that really resonates with people? Because we're all cynical buggers like you and me now. So we'll see, you know, a GCN review or I wanna go back down the bike review chat. But like that stuff's not relevant to us anymore as a as a way of getting us excited about brands. What have they got left? So the pro team is something they've got left. Results is something that they've got left. I, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Makes sense to me. Um, yeah. And I think one of, the, one of the comments that I found really interesting, I'll probably blur out Rob's name, but it just said, absurd to even suggest Trek bikes are dead. As an avid rider, I care vastly more about my bike and my riding than what team... A brand sponsors Trek makes excellent customer bikes, and that's and that is what matters to me. And he finished with "Long Live Trek," and I kind of find this interesting because <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and, and Trek's one of those brands that I think has this. It has the 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 Ford, the Ford motorist thing where you buy a Ford, you're a Ford driver for life. I think I think Trek have got that. If if you are a Trek rider, you're a Trek rider for life. I think that's maybe that's more of an American thing than than here, but I can't think of many other brands that have that. Um, what is it like that that allegiance? I mm. suppose like it's it's phenomenal, and I think it's kind of why that video last week or our chat kind of triggered so many people because you triggered all the Ford drivers who are there going, "Don't you dare have a go at my <laughs> Ford! I love my Ford, and I apologise for having a go at your Ford." But it was not it was wasn't even a comment about the bike. No, no, exactly. <laughs> but you know, our take on this now is that you know it's. It is a brand in in flux, certainly in this country anyway. Mm. Sorry, long answer. Look at a bike that was in the world tour and is now not. Factor comes mm -hmm. to mind. I mean, what a lemon. Mm. Factor. I'm sure the Focus Izalco Max disc is a great bike, but it's doing nothing. You said, you said Factor. You mean Focus? I meant Focus. <laughs> yes, all right. The Focus well, Izalco Max. You're right. Factor's gone from the world tour. Is it not in the world tour anymore? But isn't isn't Israel, oh, that, Israel Conti? That's cheeky. Just yeah. saying. Just saying. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well played. Uh, but but if you look at Factor, <laughs> fuck. If you look at, <laughs> <laughs> I can't even say the name of the brand. That's how dead they are. If you look at Focus, you're only buying one because your sh local shop stocks it. No one's going out and searching for a Focus. I mean, brands will start eating themselves in that in that respect because. You know, Focus are now obviously trying to do the whole we don't need that. And, you know, they're saving a shitload of money by not being in the world tour. Absolutely. And so if they can create rel brand relevance without having to do that, they're probably doing it at the well, at the disservice of some of the other brands because they're essentially trying to eat them, you know. What are they doing? Yeah, Have you know. seen a Focus? I've seen a lot of bikes, yeah. Have you seen a Focus where – can you remember seeing a Focus not on the road? In the last year? Good question. It's a good question. Yeah. Can we let me go. I'm going to look up focus. While you're doing that, while you're doing that, yep. it brings up it brings up another brand that I want to talk about, Scott. Okay. And this is this is like so well, you, you guys can you guys can work out where I'm going with this, right? But um I was in a, a bike shop in a retail shop not that long ago, and the Scott, the main Scott uh, distributor, the head of the Scott Distributing 
in Australia was there. And they were, I was sort of eavesdropping slash involved in a conversation, okay? And they were saying that the uh, demand, so the demand for their new Scott, uh, not the foil, the Addict RC, was huge, huge. They couldn't get over the number of inquiries the guys in Australia, this is the local Australian distributor, had received about this bike. Phenomenal. And this guy was like, he couldn't work out why. He couldn't work it out because the bike wasn't even being raced at the time in the pro... T- and he was full old school, right? It's not in the pro tour. It's not in the pro tour. I just don't understand. Why, why is it... Why is it... Why is this... Do you like my Australian yeah, distributor voice? Like, why is there so much demand for this bike? And I just sort of butted into the conversation. I was like, well, because like the biggest, if not... Well, one of the biggest cycling YouTubers in the world... He rides the bike, literally just announced that he was riding the bike. And the Australian head of distributing, distribution of Scott Bikes is there going, who? And you're like, <laughs> so it just, yeah. the disconnect is just mind-blowing, right? But it comes back to that Close. thing of like what, what, what marketing do brands have left? Mm-hmm. I mean, right. okay, you've got, you've got a pro team. You've got a an influencer. There's not much else, really. I suppose you can sponsor races. Like, what is? Did you find Focus? Yeah, uh, they are just pretty much mountain bikes now, right? And okay. a gravel bike, and a couple of. But they're just on their Instagram. They're just posting crap. On like, yeah. it's just looks like stock photos. I don't know. They are, I don't know what's going on with them. Yeah. Um, maybe they're doing really well on the mountain bike side, so they just went, oh, screw the road. Courses for courses, like the bike behind you, time. Like that that doesn't need to be in a pro team. It was at one stage. I think Simon Gerrans rode them at one stage. But like, you know, they're, they're at a different level. It's a different brand with different sort of boutique. And just on that as well with the Trek thing, quite a few comments saying how well the women's Trek team did last year one paris bay and maybe i need to follow women's cycling women's pro cycling more but it didn't really like i don't disagree like they had some fantastic results they had the world champion riding their bike but you know eyeballs are eyeballs you yeah know? um okay so guys uh we we're officially retracting some of our comments about yes. trek but let us know because that was an interesting chat i thought just about how mainstream brands go about their marketing going forward we've seen a lot of stuff on youtube with some people talking about what brands are going to do. Let us know what you think is coming in 2023. Right. I got one for you. Yeah, what do you got? Just just a quick reminder to subscribe to the podcast so you don't have to uh, look at Jesse <laughs> picking his nose. Scratch and fiddle. Mm. Um, so speaking of expensive bikes, mm. if you go out for any group ride, it is the standard for f- to have a $15,000 bike. That's just par for the course. If you have... I would say actually, if you have a bike less than six thousand Australian, you're probably in the minority. Like it's quite rare. And what I don't quite understand is why are why are people so willing to spend fifteen to twenty thousand dollars on a bike on a Cervelo S5 or a top of the range SL7? What's the mindset here? Because I always is it I don't actually know what I think. Is it is it if like a couple of things is it is it just froth and people in sydney just have a lot of money and are so on like good the forty thousand dollar video it's a bit like i've got the money i like nice things i'm gonna buy expensive things do you mean that when you say froth yes yeah 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 okay. you just froth a brand right yeah. so is it that or do people genuinely believe that that bike is High performing enough that it makes a difference for them on their ride, on their social bike ride. Yeah, yes, or social, or you know, what's it, there's no such thing as a social bike ride, is there? Even no. if you're you're heading out and you're, you're going to be ripping up a climb eventually. Um, what do you think? So I think it's performance, and that's someone who thought it was froth probably twelve months ago. Okay, and. A lot of that has come about from some of the people that I've met and the comments that I've seen in the last six months. Especially, honestly, especially around my 
buying of the factor. And the questions that I get asked by people about the factor. People who are have been riding maybe let's we'll call them COVID babies. That that sort of timeline. And I put this. Their threshold is probably two hundred and fifty watts yep. maximum. Mm-hmm. Okay. And they're asking me what the difference of the ceramic speed bottom bracket is on my my bike. So they're not asking because they like the, the look of it or or just the nice that they they genuinely want to know is there some gains in there and i like to term it well i've started terming it as a bit of a nuclear arms war because all these groups now and you're seeing a lot of the four, four five six seven guys and girls on the road and they're that's the the group of mates right the problem is one guy goes out and buys the Factor Ostro Vam, whatever, twenty grand, and ceramic speed and Dura Ace, the, the works, yeah, right, yeah, done and up. maybe that person wins the climb that day, and then then the then it's in the back of the brain of all the other people, you know. Mm. Well, so that's a thing. That's a thing, right? I think it's a unique issue because we're in Sydney, like. Generally, I, I think in Europe, from what I saw, it's not as much of a thing. You know, you if you rock up. Up to your local club, local run in the Netherlands on a twenty thousand dollar S five, you'd be laughed home if you weren't one of the old ex pro blokes. Like, and even they're not riding them. But I guess maybe it's a unique thing in Sydney because it's a very affluent city. People have a lot more disposable income. It's you know people have the money to spend. Do they? Well, yeah. Do they? I but, mean, but, but, uh, they must because the amount of people I see riding. Super expensive bikes. I just, I mean, I'm asking because I can't relate. I don't understand. I don't. It's not that I don't have them. I would just not spend that much money on a bike. So that's where I kind of went down. Okay, I wouldn't spend that much money on a bike, but why would someone? So you, it must be. It must be actual performance. It can't just be froth. People don't have that much. Some people do, but most people don't have that much money. To, I mean, but then again, people spend like thousand dollars on a pair of sneakers. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but no, you're dead right about I location. Like I, even when I was in, in Fresno over there borrowing borrowing the bike and, you know, I was borrowing some some nice bikes and that kind of stuff. But, you know, all solid sort of mid-range type things. And there was this one guy, this one guy who had a Madone and like the whole friggin' city knew him. Like <laughs> it was like just amazing. And whereas like here, like... If you don't, if, if there's a mid-range trek on the road, it's a bit like, oh, it must be a beginner, mm. you know? So Which is kind of understandable because if everyone sort of does it, you're then more inclined to do it. Yep. At a base level, are you doing it because you just love the froth of it or do you legitimately think that's going to save you 15 seconds up Bob and Head? Mm. And that's, that's where I, so performance, just my take on it is I don't think it is. Like the the speed that most people are riding at and the, the level that most people are at, they're not going to notice. And you've even found it because you've been testing, you've been on the titanium bike for about a week, just you know, very crude testing of speeds and times up climbs. And it's, if anything, there's no difference. It's certainly not, it hasn't even been slower. It's been no difference. And it's not like compared to the fact that you're even faster. It's basically much of a muchness. And that's you riding at, a relatively strong watts per kilo where you're going to start to notice some of these things. Uh, for the average person, they're not going to notice the difference in speed between a $20,000 and a $10,000 bike. So it's I find it I find it hard to believe it's performance, but may, but that's just my bias. I, I must be, you know. I mean, I don't want to give too much away about the titanium thing, but you bang on. Like, I've been doing those reps and it's like, Jesus, it's pretty frigging similar. And I'd argue like it's, potentially a more suitable bike than a lot mm. of the pro peloton things are for a lot of people but i also didn't want to like you know you're probably going to do a video on it so i'll leave it but i, I was going to even say i think you even you were shocked that you weren't slower on it 100%. compared to the factor 100%. so the performance must come into it because you was you were 
subconsciously expecting it to be slower. Yep. So let us know down below, guys, is Sydney just a ridiculously overblown, bloated society of pro peloton bikes? Or are you seeing that in, in your cities as well? I'm definitely sick of like 2022 recaps and 2023 predictions. So this is not that. But coming up, thinking forward, what uh, what sort of trends are you looking forward to trying in the next 12 months, Chris? Okay. Anything. This anything. could be oh. literally blank slate. So what are you looking full, forward to changing? Full cycling niche, anything, anything I want. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, even even on the channel. Okay. Um, so I am tempted to try time pedals. Time tempted pedals. to try time pedals. Uh, they were the first pedal I ever used. I just love the look of them. <laughs> we're just talking about look, froth. They do look. They cool, look super they? cool. Uh, I yeah, and I reckon they're updated. There's a little bit of a little bit of an exclusivity aspect to them. It's like you run Shimano or look pedals. I'm like, no, no, no. Which is probably going to come with a whole myriad of issues. But um, yeah, I, I kind of feel a bit of an allegiance to that brand, as you can tell from the bike behind you. You know what? I think speed play pedals look no. cooler. Oh, when yeah. you ride up behind someone. <laughs> This might, and you because you can see that they've got speed play pedals on usually because they're usually yellow i think they have like yellow cleats yeah it does look pro and don't then, you reckon yeah but then you get off the bike and you see the person walking and it's <laughs> <Yeah>. like, <laughs> like what's wrong not that we ever get off our bike and walk anyway what have you got have you got any uh any anything you're gonna you're gonna dip mm, into in... i've got a training one because i've got a target race coming up soon and then i don't really know what i'm gonna do next year so the training one I wanted was keen to try was the five two, which is the very niche again. The what this was the cross country skier Niels Vanderpool. He did a explanation of his training and you know crazy training volume, but he only ever trained five. He did train five days a week and then would have two days totally off week after week. And I'm curious. I'm I am curious to give it a go. Um, just from a like a life sort of balance sort of thing. So if, if I was going to do it, I'd probably train Tuesday through to Saturday. So get the Saturday right in, and then have I'd have Sunday as just a, a family day, relaxing, and then Monday off as well because Monday's the busiest work day. And then you just train five days and have two days off, and just to see not from not because I think it's going to be the next frontier of performance gains, but kind of how well can I go, always having two days off. Uh, I think it would work for my, just my brain when I, even if I have a rest day and they're like, maybe I could ride or it's just mm. not, I think just having that two days off where it's, you are not touching the bike could, could work for me mentally and with be a bit, have a bit of more balance in life. So maybe something I'll try. What about this though? I just don't know what to do with the weather mm. if I'm doing that. Mm. Like you get up. On a Saturday morning to go for that last ride of the five-day block, and it's drizzling, mm. and then you're going, "Oh, I could like take this Saturday off and then ride Sunday." So I think it would be very hard to stick to from a weather point of view. Or you see the for the forecast, and the Sunday is the banger, twenty-seven degree, perfect day. Saturday is pissing rain, nineteen degrees. Sunday is meant to be your day off. So the other thing, the other little trend that I'm tempted to have a crack at is, so I have been, and there's some, there'll be some content coming up on the channel about this, about the strength training stuff, which I've been doing with Dan. But so my strength training up until now and probably for the next month or so has been essentially like a maintenance strength training stuff. Once, twice a week, just keeping, it's just keeping me happy. I, I'm not doing it particularly for performance gains on the bike or anything. So it's been cycling and strength training, right? I want to flip that, flip that for like a period, uh, maybe a six-week block or, or some sort of thing like that and flip it completely and go like gym junkie, strength training with cycling and Oof. see how, how that plays out with me. Um, as, a, as an older member of the community, I'm interested to see how that sort of works. It's something I haven't done since I was like, God, yeah, for a long time, put it that way. Mm. So, yeah, in interested to maybe give give that a crack in 2023. The other little thing that I was <laughs> – um, and I'd be interested in some comments down below is like some kind of stupid challenges on this on the channel. I know we've talked a little bit about things. <laughs> like <laughs> there was one where it was like, like 
it, could we ride 100 k's out of the saddle? Yeah, yeah. Like, we're going to take our seat posts out and just see how long we just, can ride just for. Who could ride the longest? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's going to be you given the amount you ride out of your saddle <laughs> on the bike at the moment. But, yeah, stupid challenges. Uh, let us know, of course. I'm keen to keen to mm. try some stuff. But, yeah. that's From the crowd. From crowd the crowd, crowd, crowd source. Yeah. Crowd source some stupid ones. And finally, this is very left field, short shorts. Oof. That's why. There's got to be a good reason you know, here. I just feel like we're on. We're on the. <sighs> something needs to change. There needs to be a little change up. Maybe it's short shorts. Tommy, go longer. Go longer. Go longer. <laughs> go longer. <laughs> knee. We want down to the knee. Knee coverage. Knee coverage. Cover that patella tendon right over the top. Just three quarters all year round. Yeah. Yep. Mm. I, 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 please do that. Before okay, you go to the short shorts. Short. Well, okay. Speaking of short shorts, I do want to quickly make mention of this. Um, so it's finally warmed up here in Sydney recently. And uh, I got myself the Protein Flyweight, a Rafa Protein Flyweight jersey, which I think <coughs> is the correct, because uh, so many bloody things. But yeah, the magic, amazing, love it. Potentially uh, added to my wardrobe, full stop for the future. Love it. We'll definitely ride that down to an under. Um, also got myself the classic flyweight bib shorts. So the worst bit of Rafa <laughs> kit I've ever experienced in my life. I can't <laughs> believe these are I, – I assume they're in the archive sale now and will never appear again because they are abysmal. They're terrible. They're like plastic. They are – there's short shorts and then there's – I don't know what that was doing. <laughs> that was – that was up It's the thighs. texture that it, – it looks like – because they're so short and then they've got this rubber look to them. They're horrific. horrific. It was terrible. And the fact that they were partnered with the, the flyweight uh, jersey, which was awesome, had the beautiful long sleeves on it. So it had these like awesome long sleeves in the jersey and then like shorts that were like frigging speedos. I was like, mm. What's going on did here? Did you take a photo? I think you oh, did. I took a video. You took a video? Maybe you oh, might that up. catch it. Maybe yeah. you'll blur it out. <laughs> oh my God. Blur it out for people. One of the worst. Yeah. I don't know how that passed test. That was <laughs> not shocker. great. That was not great. But um, yeah, let me know down below, guys. Stupid challenges. We're, we're, we're on board. All right. Well, look, uh, after the raging success of my segment last oh, week. Oh, yeah. Do you have an intro? Thing? We got. Is there music we can play now? The know. Kukurit. What's it uh, called? I think you know. E- email us below with intro musics. This is Chris's. Chris's. What was it called again? Chris's co- Creators Corner. That's it. It just rolls CCC. off the tongue. CCC. Orange. Orange jersey. Remember the CCC mm. boys? Oh yeah. Oh, Jesus. Anyway. Um, so it's been a collection of. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm seeing on YouTube at the moment is a lot of that kind of 2022, 2023 stuff, like what's going on. The only man I've seen out there doing stuff is the bloke riding f- across America at the moment. The two bikes, one wheelchair, daily vlogs at Francis K. You'll is. have to explain. I have no idea what you're talking about. So, yeah, Francis is riding across the US, um, uh, two bikes, one wheelchair, uh, raising money for Kids Get Going explanation mark. Um, okay. And they've so far raised 200000 US dollars in this uh, um, experience riding across it. But from a, from a like, incredible, awesome, you know, good on him for doing that. But just, like, the actual content-wise, like, he's daily vlogging it, right? My God, what a punish. Like, fair play, <laughs> Francis. This is just, he's bashing him out daily. So the reason I brought this up, other than the fact that he's churning out some some bloody good stuff here, is that I kind of feel like this is, this is what like cycling vloggers are bloody good at. This type of documenting, documenting a journey, documenting a trick, not putting aside the raising the money thing, which is all great, all brilliant, but just ultimately you watch those videos, right? And, and... You come away with this thing of, I want to go out and ride my bike. Yeah, ultimately what I think any of us on YouTube are trying to, to ultimately, well, stop saying ultimately, it's a drinking game, by the way, um, to achieve with with your videos. And because, like, I think back to, you know, but I, probably before cycling vloggers and stuff were around, like, Rafa used to do these Rafa Continental videos, 
Now, these, you may not remember these, but this was like the first sort of cycling content that I ever saw on YouTube. And it was just like a group of four or five guys riding like the Tour of California and stuff like this. And you saw these videos and you're like, oh, my God, I just want to go ride my bike and buy all their gear because this is amazing. This is the best. I'm so excited about riding my bike now. And Rafa subsequently released their Gone Racing thing this week and it's kind of their the same sort of iteration, I suppose, of, of that content. And you watch it now and you're just like, oh, no, I don't. Or do you think it's because you're not in the same, you, you as a rider isn't in the same place anymore? So you're probably not finding that interesting. Maybe. Like that would be interesting to see in the comments whether people, you know, that whether that Rafa video like really sparked people again like it used to. Like, oh, man, like I remember Cervelo used to have a channel called um, Beyond the Peloton. It was like before Backstage Pass and that sort of stuff and it was Heinrich Hausler and like and Tor Hushovd and it was like, oh, my God, like this is so cool. It's pro bike racing but like they're just chatting like like mates and stuff and now it's just like. Or maybe it's just been done too many times now. It's just a bit too predictable. I think that's potentially. Um, yeah, look, put some um, recommendations down below for uh, CCC for next week. But I want to try and try and keep just giving people a shout out every week for, for what they're up to. I think that's about it. Thanks for watching or listening. Everyone, subscribe to the channel. Check out the podcast link if you just want to listen and not look at our ugly mugs. And we'll catch you next week, hopefully.